so far we have been discussing the status and the development of economics, law, and politics in the modern context. Today, I will be discussing the methods and technology that make this fast development possible, along with certain problems that technology is faced with. In today's world, he or she who has the most information has the edge over the competition. Today, information is delivered by computing technology, state-of-the-art computing technology which is rapidly developed. The real-world trial and experimentation data provided by researchers serve as a basis to model physical and social phenomena using computing technology. The modeling itself is what delivers the information that is useful for the competitors and for competitors' success. For competitive success, excuse me. This information can be later implemented in design suggestions to improve product performance and in doing so also increase <coughs> profits. Or even gain favorability if we are talking about political outcomes or statements and so on and so forth. An example of this mathematical modeling is that of maybe lung tissue expansion in cancer patients who have been taking special, taking special anti-cancer drugs. The information gathered by this modeling procedure can give researchers an edge on drug design. The data types, however, are limitless. They need not be at all physical or medical in nature. They can go through the social realms, through even uh, educational realms as well or even judicial realms, which, which is kind of harder, more complicated to come by using mathematical modeling, but nonetheless it still is possible. What makes modeling of this nature possible is computing technology. Computing technology is so suitable because it is able to deal with data and produce information from data. It is important here, however, to distinguish the differences between these two concepts. Data is not information. It is just an element that is expressed within information. It's just a sentence. Just as a sentence would be information, data would be a simple word within a sentence, completely meaningless without context. And since the data we are using to model real life events are immense in size, sheerly almost impossible to store on a small in, in, in all of the books in the world, or even within a classroom, if we work with much smaller information, uh, computing technology is there to help us. So supercomputing technology currently being used for high-end processing and for gaining the edge of the competition are currently introducing new variants of processing speeds based on data flow technology, such as is being developed at the electrotechnical faculty in Belgrade, Serbia, as well as in, at the Technical University in Munich. Both solutions exhibit short, out, shortcomings, even the maxillar solution and older supercomputing solutions, as we will see within the presentation. But it is proper to address these shortcomings as best as possible in order for us to get a better understanding of what our tools are dealing with while they help us get the edge on the competition. So to start off, my presentation title, as we all see, is uh, Space Filling Curves and Cache Oblivious Traversals of Adaptive Meshes. Sounds very cryptic and uh, not so familiar for, for any of the humanists out there, but uh, it has a lot to do with the humanities studies and, and uh, social sciences as well. So to start, partial differential equations, which I will not get into much detail, PDEs, in other words, are tools, mathematical tools, used for modeling real events. Information gathered from these real events gives us an edge in learning and competition, and developing new plans for new projects, and so on and so forth. The concept behind partial differential equations is mathematically geometric in nature, and it's based on recursion. Recursion is based on a loop wise uh, tessellation of a larger plane, geometric plane, into smaller geometric planes that are of the same unit. So for instance, partial differential equations geometrically can model in two ways. They can use a unit of a square, or they can use a unit of a triangle. Hence, triangular grids or quadratic grids. 
Now, what's very interesting about partial differential equations, this is just one tool, by the way. There are many tools. There are probabilistic tools. There are statistic tools that can be used for all of this modeling, but let's focus on PDs, just as an example. What's interesting about PDEs, however, is uh, their refinement methods. They can be refined. So these grids that are coarse and very large at the beginning have the ability to become much smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, given that the smaller these grids become, the smaller that these triangles become, the higher resolution we have in modeling our natural phenomena, in modeling our our target model, modeling our target phenomena that we wish to model. And the more memory space we would need on a computer to store this extreme, uh, extreme tessellated geometric model. So as we see here, we'll come across these uh, shortcomings in more detail and express them once we clarify exactly the geometric uh, outlook of these, uh, of these two uh, grid types. As, it, as mentioned previously, the quadratic grid would look something like this. On the left-hand side, you see a unit plane, a square, which is cut up into several smaller squares. These smaller squares represent first and second step recursions of modeling the natural phenomena. On the left-hand side, we have a picture of a natural phenomenon. In this case, it's some cellular tissue with a certain geometric edges, it looks like an X with, a, with an O in between, which is, it doesn't really matter, but you can see around these edges and around this shape, you can see exactly the refinement level of the partial differential equations. This refinement level, the smaller these squares are, the better we can model this reality. And this reality is of a cellular nature. On the second slide, we have an example of the triangular tessellated lens. Now, Covering these two, uh, one might ask themselves the question, why would we use two? Why, why do we have two special grid types? Well, and it, it's interesting. Uh, it has been proven through trial and error that the triangular grid types have been used more or less in static domains, where we are monitoring something that doesn't have any motion involved in it. So these static grids can be used for modeling uh, two-dimensional changes, Let's say, for example, uh, a mouse running across a table or so. Uh, however, in a three-dimensional space, motion is much better modeled using this triangular tessellated partial differential equation. And this is an example, actually, of air found on top of uh, air, air molecules and air density found on top and below of an airplane wing. And it's very unstructured, basically. But to get down to the nitty gritty, uh, these partial differential equations and their geometric representations are very, very large. So, using computer aided computation, we seek to reduce the costs of the computation, to reduce the costs of the memory space, and reduce the costs of other resources, especially time and money. General problems encountered, however, by algorithms that are used to, to refine and shorten and make these triangles smaller and smaller and higher up our resolution on a problem, uh, they encounter certain computer-aided uh, computational concerns such as limited memory space and limited loading speed. Even though the computing age is here and we are really quickly advancing it with our computer technology, uh, we still have a very serious problem with loading speed, which means how fast do we put data from the memory into the processor. It sounds trivial, but it's fast, it's the speed of light, it's, uh, it has to do with uh, electricity. No, it doesn't, no. It has to do with logical structuring of the internal components of, uh, of the motherboard processing processor as well as the RAM memory. So specific algorithmic problems can result uh, within the cache in this section of processing. As we'll see later on throughout the slides, we have a special hierarchy of memory in order to speed up this loading from memory into the processor, which is the main part of computing. Memory to processor communication. This is computing. Everything else is not computing. Everything else
process peripheral. So to speed this feeding of data and instructions from memory into the processor, we use a hierarchy of smaller and smaller and smaller <coughs> memories. The smaller these memories become, the faster their connection speed is to the processor. The faster their connection speed is to the processor, the more we can push in through this hierarchy and get done. However, the smaller they get, the less data we can put through. But that's, uh, that's another story that has to be dealt with and is being dealt with uh, precisely now at this moment with uh, Maxilar and, and supercomputing at Maxilar and the, te the Tech University at, uh, at the ETF in Belgrade and also the Imperial College in London. Uh, so these intercache delays do occur between these caches. These cache levels are very fast and the delays between them can occur if the data is fetched from a higher cache at a faster rate than, <coughs> from, than, than the data is pushed to a smaller cache at, a, at an even faster rate. So it's more or less a, a clogging problem, as we'll see. But these large data structures can't fit, in, fit into cache memory. They fit into the hard drive space because they can be 200 gigabytes large, <coughs> one terabyte large. That can't fit into the normal memory chip. So what we have to solve in this case is how do we tessellate how do we uh, refine our partial differential equations without loading the entire grid into memory? Well, we have to figure out an algorithmic scheme of cooperation between hard disk, which is a peripheral device. It's not too much, it doesn't have to do with processing. It's not computing, it's just a storage device. We have to figure out a method for the hard disk to properly communicate and uh, establish a protocol-wise Function, functional scheme with the memory for better and faster processing and tessellating of these small grids. Otherwise, these small grids can be tessellated for a thousand years, which is uh, really not, not in anybody's uh, favor. So the main concerns, however, representing mathematical and analytical data is uh, the data structures used for, for this for these large grids. As mentioned, the data structure is divided into two. One part is being processed, and the other part is stored on the hard disk. The process part is just big enough for it to fit into the faster memory and to uh, be processed in due time. This here is an example of a memory hierarchy of a processing unit, the fastest uh, storage units within the computer or within the, yeah, within the processor and the memory are registers. So registers we don't count really because they are integral parts of the processing unit. But the cache memory, the levels of memory that we experience are shown here. We have onboard cache which is right next to the CPU and it's very fast. We have the main memory which is a bit slower than the cache. We have the disks and tapes. The first level memory, the fastest, uh, the fastest memory lane, is what we are gearing to speed up, and to, and we're gearing towards it to minimize cache miss misses and minimize, uh, synchronize in a sense, the flow from data from memory to the register through the cache. It's in certain instances, when main memory gets clogged up with information from the hard drive. This main memory tends to sift and dump all of the extra stuff, all of the extra data found on it, onto the cache memories. But the cache memories are too small, so they can't fit as much memory, as much data as the main memory would like to give it. So what it does is it sends this mem it sends this data back into the main memory, and this data is lost. So we have to redo this entire process of loading this, the the data from the hard disk onto the main memory and then into the cache, into the uh, in, into the smaller processor caches. And this takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of energy resources, and it really isn't, uh, it isn't in nobody's favor. So, what one solution is, is the utilization of cache-efficient algorithms. Algorithms that utilize cache memory while reducing strain on both memory resources and processing time. And there are two basic types of cache-efficient algorithms. Uh, the first type are cache-aware algorithms and cache-oblivious algorithms. In one case, there, are, there is a finite number of caches that could be missed, which this, these cache-aware algorithms are used on all of our PCs. 
However, in the cash oblivious sense, uh, no cash misses occur, which is uh, what we're gearing towards currently. And mind you, this has nothing really to do with the hardware anymore. This has to do a lot with the logic behind how the hardware is used. So in this virtual cash sense, we try to reduce the number of cash miss it misses just by reducing the problem itself. Because if you take a big problem and put it into the memory, memory is going to have a hard time solving this problem and shifting it to the processor. Solving, solving the, the shift problem of the problem, moving the problem into the processor for processing. It's going to have a big problem with it. So what we have to do is, already before this data is brought from the hard drive onto the main memory, we have to chop it up in a proper way. And this chopping up of the problem itself, or the data for the problem itself, is known as the command and conquer approach. And one, one of the main command and conquer approaches, or divide and conquer approaches, uh, either terms are equivalent, uh, are space filling curves. Space filling curves are a mathematical principle again, but they use an algorithmics to tessellate and slowly visit the triangulated grids and uh, PDEs that model reality. Two types of so it's two types of space filling curves are Sierpinski curves, for example. These curves are used in triangular grids, and uh, as they visit each edge of the each side of the triangles, they chop up the larger part of the triangle based on information provided by this uh, one the, the side that it visited within the triangle. Another type of space filling curve are Hilbert curves, which are quadratic in nature and they visit quadratic sides. Their elementary pieces are of U-like shapes, as you can see, and they are uh, more or less uh, in current research trends a bit more than the Sierpinski curves you just showed previously. So basically, how these how these uh, curves help us in reducing cash misses are simply given their deterministic root. Their root is very deterministic. Once we know where they start, we know where they're going to end. Their root always says go up, visit the first the first edge, then move to the left edge, then go up again and move to the left edge. So we know basically when it's going to be finished, uh, traversing all of the all of the grid elements. So what it does is as it traverses each side of the grid element, it takes these grid elements and puts them into memory from the hard drive. So it's a basically you have this big grid on the hard drive and then pieces just go into memory, they get processed and then brought back. Instead of putting this whole big chunk of grids and data onto your memory, you you do a divide and conquer approach. You take piece by piece and conquer piece by piece. And then slowly refine the grids back on the hard drive. So this is just a simple uh, representation of uh, how important actually it is to understand the hard comes and the, and the hardships shown by and experienced by researchers out there and the computers they use to deliver the competitive edge uh, to the market and as well as to the education institutions, political institutions, and especially law institutions in the probabilistic sense. Thank you.